Um, and for those, for those of you that I don't know, and I think I know many people here tonight, I'm Arnold Lehman, director of the Brooklyn Museum, and I am truly delighted to welcome you to the second annual Norma Marshall Memorial Lecture. Uh, many of us here tonight knew and admired Norma, and your fond memories and ours of her are echoed certainly by your participation in this lecture series. However, for those of you who do not know Norma, uh, she became an incredibly enthusiastic supporter of the Brooklyn Museum from almost the moment she and her husband Jim became museum members in 1975. And perhaps uh, during that time period, her major role was her very long service as president of the museum's community committee, where she led the active engagement with the museum through, certainly, the force of her incredibly positive and productive personality. One of Nora's greatest accomplishments was working with the museum on the establishment in 2002 of the Women in the Arts Program and Award which has now become nationally known and respected. Uh, indeed, Norma was a singular presence, both inside and outside the museum, and she was a wonderful friend to us all. Through the generosity of Jim Marshall, who I might add is one of our truly great gallery guides, coming probably right off of a tour tonight. I was listening. <laughs> and other friends, uh, this lecture series was established last year, and our first wonderful speaker was Segne Ngundi. Uh, its purpose is to bring distinguished speakers to the Brooklyn Museum to celebrate women artists, a topic dear to Norma's heart. And needless to say, we are extremely grateful to Jim and to the Norma Marshall Memorial Fund for making this evening possible. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome so many members of Jim and Norma's family who are here with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are truly delighted to welcome as our guest speaker this evening, Lorraine O'Grady. And there is, I'm not even going to try, because there's no better person to introduce Lorraine than Catherine Morris, our Sackler family curator, for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Thank you again for coming this evening. Thank you for your support of the Brooklyn Museum. And we all remember Norma so well. Thank you very much. Catherine. Mademoiselle Bourgeoisie Noir, 
Um, O'Grady appeared in a character at gallery and museum openings to critique art world seg segregation and timidity. It remains an historical touchstone. Subsequently, the O'Grady has used a variety of mediums and strategies from performance to photography to video installation, consistently producing work that is unapologetically political, conceptually rigorous, and visually beautiful. All the while pushing herself and other artists and critics to engage with the intersections of race, class, and gender. This long before the that long before this has become has come to be the th theoretically popular position that it is today. In addition to the Brooklyn Museum, her work is included in the collections of the Art Institute of Chicago, Harvard University, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Wadsworth Ethnam, and the Walker Art Center, among others. She has had many solo museum and gallery shows, and her work has appeared in important group shows, including most recently, Radical Presence, Black Performance in Contemporary Art at the Studio Museum and Gray Art Gallery, Blues for Smoke at the Whitney Museum, This Will Have Been, Art, Love, and Politics in the 1980s at the ICA Boston, and way back in 2007, in the groundbreaking survey WAC, Art in the Feminist Revolution. Her criticism and success has appeared in art and popular press, as well as being anthologized in books on contemporary art and feminism. From 1974 to 2000, she taught at the School of Visual Arts here in New York, and most recently served as visiting faculty at the Skarhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. Today, she joins us to share some of her thoughts on the currently touted political ideologies of post-racial and post-feminist, and how those ideas have impacted on her work. Please help me in joining Please join me. <laughs> Because, uh, because it, 
applies to my work in any way that I talk about my work. It's always about the both and. And the both and is uh, my way of coming out as strongly as I can against um, uh, Western philosophy, which is based on the either or. Okay. So there you go. It's a, I don't know how I'll talk about it. You'll see quite instantly about the both and. The first uh, piece that I want to talk about is a guerrilla art invasion that I uh, did. Uh, I actually began in 1980, and I was a fully formed person. I was 45 years old when I made my first art piece, and I had come from many different experiences. And I have to say that uh, I went to Wellesley I was, when I was 16 in 1951, and uh, I went to uh, the uh, the federal government when I was, you know, in 1956, and I've done many things. I've been an art, I've been a rock critic for the Village Voice and Rolling Stone in 1972 to 75, approximately. Uh, and none of these worlds, in none of these worlds that I was in, had I ever experienced the blatant racism that I encountered in the art world. And I tried to figure this out. What was this? And uh, so my work was uh, very much about that at the, when I began. And, uh, and in 1980, I did this first uh, performance at a gallery, which is a gallery where, uh, called the Just Above Midtown Gallery. It was a black avant-garde gallery where just about every uh, one that you would have heard of uh, had their start. David Hammond showed there, Sam and Goody showed there, uh, Marin Hassinger, Fred Wilson, Delmo Bay. Uh, we all showed there, um, and we were totally segregated. And uh, the 1983 Whitney Biennial, uh, which featured uh, the very, very young uh, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, I'm sorry, are you hearing me better now? Uh, uh, the, uh, the 1983 Biennial featured Jean-Michel Basquiat, but you have to understand that nobody at Just Above Midtown had received a studio visit. That so that was an issue. <laughs> so I uh, went, first of all, I, my work is always addressed to uh, both uh, the black blacks and the black art world, whites and the white art world. So, and I make enemies wherever I go. <laughs> <laughs> I have no friends. <laughs> oh, uh, so this piece is meant. <coughs> Okay, it's called Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir, and it's uh, <coughs> Miss Black Middle Class. And uh, I had gra uh, graduated in 55 from Wellesley, and so this was being done in 1980, which was the 25th anniversary of my graduation. And uh, actually, when I, uh, I was sewing my costume when my class was having its 25th reunion. And then after that, I did this performance. Late, in, late June of 1980. These, and she's going to the, uh, this, in this case, uh, she's going to uh, the New Museum um, to protest an all-white show there. Uh, and uh, she, she first done it at the Just Above Midtown um, Gallery to protest some very safe abstract art. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you know, I, I didn't know very much about uh, about um, documentation, so I don't have any real and good pictures or any almost any pictures of the performance that I did a year before this at Just Above Midtown Gallery. So that's why I don't have it there. But I can read you the poem that I shouted out at the opening of, of the new space downtown. Okay, this is an all-black gallery, and almost everybody at the opening is black. And I shot up this poem after I beat myself with a whip. <laughs> That's enough. No more boot licking, no more ass kissing, no more buttering up, no more posturing of super assimilants. Black art must take more risks. That's what I was shouting out to black artists in 1980. Okay, so 1981, and uh, we're dealing with a situation where uh, they should have invited me to be in the show, I thought, but they did it without me. 
called the persona, the artist employing persona. So I'm leaving, and that's me in my hallway. I'm entering with my master of ceremonies. This is still in the museum, but part of the museum. This is important. This, this uh, location is at Fifth Avenue on 14th Street. And I have a, a bouquet, and I start giving out flowers, and I say, well, you help me lighten my heavy bouquet, and I smile. And I smile some more. And people are getting kind of curious about the, the gown because it's made of 180 pairs of white gloves, which I shot New York out of. I from from the, from uh, from uh, the, the Battery up to 125th Street. I bought all the white gloves I could find. I'm giving away the flowers. I have 36 chrysanthemums, and I'm giving them all away. And finally, all the uh, chrysanthemums have been given away, and I'm getting ready for business. So I take off my, uh, I take off uh, my uh, cape. I have a bare back. And I'm about to start beating myself because I, the, the, the with, I'm beating myself with what I call the whip that made plantations move. And after I beat myself for about five minutes, I start to shout out a poem. Again, this is another poem. And this is sort of addressed, this is sort of addressed to uh, the white art world, but again, in some ways, more, direct, more directed to the black art world. Wait, wait in your alternate, alternate spaces, spitting on fish hooks of hope. Be polite, wait to be discovered. Be proud, be independent. Tongues cauterized at openings no one attends. Stay in your place. After all, art is only for art's sake. That's enough, don't you know? Sleeping beauty needs more than a kiss to awake. Now is the time for an invasion. Okay, well this is 1980, 81, and nobody listened. <laughs> so as a result, the art world didn't really get effectively, uh, at a, at least a superficial level, integrated until seven years later in 1988, when I think Adrian Piper had her first uh, big so, uh, uh, retrospective, and David Hammond had a big retrospective in the following year, 1989. So it was 88, 89, about uh, eight years, nine years after. So nobody likes me. <laughs> there she is, shouting her poem. And there she is celebrating with her friends. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that unfortunately of these people, the only one that you might know, there's been unsadly many deaths at that table, uh, the only one that you might know is the lower right, and that's David Hammond. Now, I got terminally, I got terminally uh, disappointed, discouraged, because of course nobody was listening. And um, as I said, in 1983, there was this Whitney Biennial that nobody had, been, had received a studio visit for, but was featuring a 21-year-old John Michel Basquiat. And so I decided, uh, oh, I'm sorry. There you go, I'm a little ahead of myself. I forgot I was doing this. this piece had a history after it was done, and the history was very different. People began to appreciate it, began to like it, began to even love it a little bit, and the first place that it was shown was at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in 1994. And there it is in its little retreat. And then the show that uh, Catherine mentioned, which was in 2007, when it had become loved so much that it became an entry point to uh, the, the great uh, show curated by Connie Butler called Whack, Art and the Feminist Revolution. So it had a trajectory. 
But in 1983, I was totally discouraged, and so I decided, so Mademoiselle Bourgeois became an entrepreneur. Not an entrepreneur, I should say, impresario. She put on events. The first event that she did was the Black and White Show, which was her answer to uh, the Whitney Biennial, and it, uh, all, it had a conceit, which was that all the work was in black and white, and half the artists were black and half the artists were white. And it was about holding something still so that one could see what the differences were, if any. This is the uh, front gallery. This is the front gallery of uh, Cantalova Gallery. Cantalova Gallery had about five small spaces within the space. It's called the front gallery. And if you'll see over on the far right up there, that Keith Herring. And I would say that Keith was the person who he, he'd been a former student, and he was the one who most helped make this show a success to the extent that it was. It was never reviewed. But at least people knew about it, some people. The point that I was making got made, I think, most effectively in uh, the back gallery uh, where I put uh, conceptual pieces. Uh, this piece is, uh, this is one piece, and this is in that same gallery. Was this one. And nearly everybody who popped their head into the gallery thought that it was by the same artist. But this piece is by a, a black, just above Midtown artist called Randy Williams. And, I'm sorry, this other piece is by a, a white, a French fluxus artist called Jean Dupuy. They were doing, they were saying very, very different things, but they were using the same techniques. And outside, uh, I had, to, this was the, East Second Street was the largest drug, uh, supermarket in Manhattan at the time, and uh, I tried to uh, bring that outside inside, and I uh, commissioned a, a, a guy from uh, the Bronx who was very famous for doing these uh, kind of digital lead uh, things, his name was John Factor, uh, to do a mural, and I, I waited and I waited and I waited, and he did it the night before the opening, and there it was. and. Um, I thought it was just great. It was so great that for one year, nobody graffitied it. <laughs> but that's how great One year, no, no graffiti. However, uh, you can see, uh, there was a piece uh, maybe a year or so later in, um, in Art in America, and you can see they photographed it, and there were no graffiti. And, but the thing was that really uh, pissed me off about this was that this piece, which had become sort of like the emblem of the East Village art movement, and was uh, shown here at, in the uh, facing page of the start of an article about the East Village, did not mention the black and white show and did not mention Kate Hell the Gallery. That was what we were up against. So, also, uh, as I say, my work sort of, sort of goes, I have, I'm an equal opportunity critic. So I criticize you know, the white art world, but then I also criticize you know, black people. Uh, and uh, what happened was that I was working on an issue collective for heresies. Uh, the mother collective would farm out individual issues of the journal to uh, special collectives. Uh, and this was the racism collective. And unfortunately, uh, they didn't know many black women or met black women artists. And so the collective was one of the very few of the heresies issued collectives that had non-artists. And one of these uh, non-artists was a black social worker. And we were having a meeting, and, uh, and she turned to me, and she was sitting beside me, she turned to me, and she said very contemptuously, Black art doesn't have anything to do with black people. Avant-garde art. Avant-garde art doesn't have anything to do with black people. And I was so furious. I set out to prove her wrong. So I uh, put, I said, I said, okay, I'm going to put avant-garde art into the biggest forum that I can think of for black people. So I put it into the Afro-American Day Parade with a million viewers. And I made this float, 
and it has a 9 by 15 foot empty gold frame, and only instruction to the people where art is written on the side. And I put um, about 15 uh, uh, black uh, actors and dancers uh, carrying empty gold frames, and I told them what to do. So everything that you see is flows through is art. And I have about 400 of these images, and so I'm just showing you three or four. <laughs> and this is what they were doing. And people were composing themselves. And then they started shouting, that's right, that's what art is, we are art. And frame me, make me the art. They got it. And if you look very closely, we, we had to rest sometimes on the, on the float as it moved along, and then Notice very closely, uh, she's wearing a white karate suit, but she had her gloves into her chest. <laughs> and um, and uh, those were the gloves that she herself wore in 1955 when she was doing her job interviews. But she didn't have the courage to put them in her costume, so she left them out. But now she was now she was so angry that she didn't care, so she was confessing. These are my gloves, and I was that sort of girl, too. This is my favorite piece from that, because uh, you don't know what that girl, whether she's laughing, whether she's smiling with you or smiling against you. I loved it. It's such an ambiguous thing. She didn't know what we were doing necessarily, or she did, and maybe she was commenting on it. I don't know. OK, now, OK, that was one body of work. And I am going to be doing a performance character uh, that is very much like Mademoiselle Bush one more, but for, 19, for 2015 or 16 or 17 or whenever it will work together. But how is she going to talk in this post-racial age? How is she going to, how is she going to, it, what is she, how different is she going to have to be than Mademoiselle Beauchamp Mark was in order to be heard at all? That's what I want to know. Okay, now, I'm going to talk about a piece which I hope some of you have seen. It's a piece which is owned by uh, the Berkeley Museum called Miscegenated Family Album. And it started uh, as a piece about my sister and Nefertiti, because I always thought they looked alike. But like everything I do, it had it multi overdetermined, so that it was a very personal piece about uh, two sets of sisters. Nefertiti's younger sister was Medjmet, and she was uh, actually somebody who um, I knew how she felt. In all of the in all of the iconography of that period in ancient Egypt, Nejmet follows Nefertiti and Akhenaten and their six daughters. She comes at the end of the procession, and she's always accompanied by two dwarfs. Okay, I know how that feels, right? So I so my sister had died, and we had not resolved our relationship. So I was sort of trying to talk to my sister through talking about Nefertiti and her sister. But I also was extremely incensed with Egyptology and traditional Egyptology that was still saying that, you know, Egypt wasn't black, didn't have anything to do with black culture. And I, it was the same story that I had heard when I was in the third grade and they pulled down the, uh, black, the, the maps over the chalk blackboard and the teacher pulled down the map of Africa, and she said, children, this is Africa, all except this. And I knew something that went, and I knew something was being taken away from me. So <laughs> I was like, on you with my blood and never TV, and I wanted to get it all back. So there was a lot of different uh, things going on. This was a performance in 1980, three months after. I did this performance three months after I did the first version of Memory of Seven the War. And this, is uh, me um, trying to talk to Devonian, but she's dead, trying to bring her back to life in some way so that I can have a conversation with her. So I'm doing something called the opening of the mouth ceremony, except that nothing works. Everything is the opposite of what the instructions are. 
but that's, uh, so there were 65 sets of uh, double images projected behind me as I worked. The opening of the mouth ceremony is based, is the year after the death. One year after the death, there's a ceremony. And these images, uh, these sculptural images that have been placed in the tomb or in the pyramid or wherever, uh, the priests come and they strike. They strike the mouth and the ears and the eyes. Uh, and they, uh, they say, and it's about allowing the spirit to move out into the universe. And they say, hail Osiris, I open your mouth for you. I open your two eyes for you. I open your two ears for you. You are protected and you shall not die. And they do this with an, with the awl and the adze, and because uh, they say smooth, they smooth with the awl and they even strike with the adze. And I'm striking pictures of Nefertiti and then of Devonia. And it is such a hopeless thing because they will not live and they will not speak and they will not talk back to me. And this is one of those things that I had to learn to have with that the Devonian was dead. We were never going to really have this conversation, but this was the best I could do. And uh, at the end, I'm trying to straddle these two subs of sand, and I can't make it. And so the image closes, in, so that the performance closes in darkness, and all you can hear is me failing to make the other tub of sand. And just like this. Well, I never give up. So, uh, as you notice, it says 1980. That was when Nefertiti, the Ronnie Pants one, the performance was. And then 1994, I took, of the 65 double images that went behind me, I took 16 and made a uh, two-dimensional installation, uh, which you now have here at the Berkeley Museum. The, the, uh, the piece, it starts with uh, a piece called Sibling Rivalry, and this is Nefertiti and her sister, Mutnejmet. The piece is, yes, it's about uh, the way, it's very much about the way in which uh, Egyptology and, and Western culture has structured uh, Egypt, e Egypt to not re reflect what in truth was its uh, beginnings but uh, it's very much more about, to me, the sisters that we're born with and the sisters that we choose. So instantly, they've chosen each other and not us. Devonia and Nefertiti. Sibling rivalry to sisters. This is sister number one. This is uh, sister number two. This is uh, Maritatin and uh, Candace. Uh, they're both of their uh, women's oldest daughters. And uh, this is uh, Makitatin and Kimberly, the two younger daughters. And these are the sisters that are left with each other. This is Lorraine and Wittnagement. And here they are. Uh, this is called um, uh, ceremonial occasions. Devonia is in a maid of honor in a wedding, and uh, uh, and Nefertiti is performing her illustration ceremony. Uh, this is ceremonial occasions two. Uh, Devonia is uh, at the wedding reception of a cousin of mine who just got married, and um, and Nefertiti is uh, performing an Aten ceremony, and I thought, my God, I saw these goblets and, and these little children behind them. And, so and this is called The Mother's Kiss, and uh, it's uh, Devonia and Candace, and I don't know which of, uh, of uh, Nefertiti had six, six daughters, six children who lived. I don't know which one that is, but that's her. And you know, obviously, another aspect of this is Crusade Shows, Pumim shows, you know, the one thing 
change the way they take the thing. And uh, we have, uh, this is a picture, uh, unfortunately Tony did have a little boy, but he sort of fell out of the, of the piece because uh, 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 Nefertiti only had daughters. <laughs> so that forever, never got made it really into the piece except in this one picture. And uh, there, she's reading to Candace and Edward, and she's being sort of guardian angeled by Nefertiti. And of course, it's the same way that we look different in every photograph, they look different in every, uh, in every sculpture. And I would say that this is probably much closer to the way Nefertiti actually looked than the very formal portrait. <coughs> And here they are, the children are growing up. This is Akesun Pa'atan, one of the younger of the daughters, and Candace. And if Akesun Pa'atan had had her uh, wig on, because they didn't wear, they shaved their heads and don't wear wigs, she would have had the wig of the young girl, which would have been the long single wig <coughs> on the left. But she does not have her wig. And uh, call this one worldly princesses. This is uh, uh, Vaka again and Kimberly. And I just think of them as little spoiled rich girls, but they had a kind of a funny, you know, that kind of spoiled rich girls. Yeah. And this is their husbands, and who knew that their husbands were even going to look alike? <laughs> That's uh, Akhenaten, the famous Akhenaten, who was supposedly the founder of monotheism. And that's Edward. that's Edward. And here they are. Uh, this is this uh, is a series of two diptychs called Progress of Queens. And this is them when they're both uh, 24 years old. 23, 24, 23 and 24. And this is uh, both 35. We you know what that's about. And this is an image that I made that was not in the original uh, um, performance. I made it for this uh, installation, and I made it out of who I was at that moment. I was somebody who would walk down the street and look very longingly at women, at younger women. Not because I wanted to have them, but because I wanted to be them. And so I got this idea about this piece. And this is actually the last image that we have of Nefertiti. Uh, her, her, you know, her stomach is sagging. She's had actually 12 pregnancies, only six lived. Uh, and uh, she's just looking across at Devonia's youngest daughter, who's like, you know, sophomore in college and just at the height of her beauty. That's Kimberly. So it's called, this piece is called Cross-Generational, but it's about that longing. And the, the, the installation as a whole ends with this piece, which is called Hero Worship. It's, it starts with Zoe Marbury and ends with Hero Worship. And it's uh, Devonia and myself, I'm three and she's 14, and on the other one I'm 13 and she's 24. And if the, if, the, uh, if the installation is hung in my ideal way, it makes a circle so that at the end, the two pieces come together, hero worship and sibling rivalry. And I have found that for all of the political things that I have put into this piece, and there were many of them, uh, now the piece is much beloved. It's been purchased here. It's also a piece where wherever I go, the, the strongest responses don't have anything to do with Egyptology or anything like that. The strongest responses wherever I go around the world are from women who have sisters. So that's that. And as I said, but I'm, let me just move on. I was asked to, uh, I, I was asked to put, uh, leave, to, to put an image that I could leave with you while we talked. And uh, as I said, I'm revisiting things. And I want to do something about my mother, Lena. 
And uh, could we not turn it on yet? Uh, I want to do something about my mother, Lena, just in the same way that I did something about my sister, Dvonia. And um, I became obsessed with a woman whose name was Jean Duval, who was uh, who lived with was had a common law marriage with Charles Baudelaire, the father of uh, modernist literature, the French poet. Uh, and uh, her name was Jean Duval, and she came from Haiti. And so for 20 years they lived together. And I adore Charles Baudelaire, and I know that he was a I feel that he was able to make this great leap from romanticism to modernism uh, because he was exposed, not just because of what was happening, and the changes in French cultural life with the Industrial Revolution and Paris getting noisy and falling apart, but also because he was living with the, a woman who I would say was, he, he may have been the first modernist, but she was the first postmodernist. The woman of color from from the colony who's come to live in the metropole. And uh, she'd come from Haiti and moved to Paris. And um, he didn't just live with her in a sort of vacant way. He had to live her life with her. And so he got his dream job, which was as a uh, editor of a prestigious uh, literary journal in a town outside of Paris. And he went there to set things up to them set the apartment up and so on. And then she arrived. And the people who published the journal said, what's this? And he said, well, she's my partner. And they said, well, that's fine. We can't have that. And so he lost his job. So you know that throughout their 20 years of marriage, this is what happened a lot. And I feel that this is what gave him the distance on his own culture to make this incredible critical leap from romanticism to modernism. So that's what I've been doing. I've been doing work on Jean de Val and Charles Baudelaire, but I stopped it. It wasn't going where I wanted it to go, and it didn't start to go where I wanted it to go uh, until I started making Jean de Val talk like my mother. So instead of a Haitian, she starts to speak Jamaican patois. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Alina, the mother. And this is the two of them. <coughs> they were born basically 90 years apart. And the world didn't change that much. The world was a very slow moving place. And so I was able to imagine that, uh, what, uh, that what Jeanne had encountered when she went to Paris at the age of uh, 18 or so was exactly what my mother had encountered when she came from Jamaica to Boston in 1917 when she was 18. And I could make them speak similarly, not identically. But I have to say that I think I'm learning more about my mother than I am about Jean de Bob in this process. And so, and so as a result, the next, the, the, when I rework this piece, it's going to be more about Lena than about Jean. But I wanted to uh, leave that with you. As the, they asked me to put a, piece, a picture up that could stay there. prettier and smarter than either of her daughters. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> and we've spoken about sort of having some questions in relationship to, um, to these projects that you're thinking about and, and, and some questions that you had that you thought the audience might participate in, in answering. But I have to say, I, um, 
as a respondent to kind of falling down on the job because I feel like I have so many questions <laughs> and so many different points of entry into um, um, both the work. Were you able to kind of like look it up online and so forth? Oh, yeah. I do have a website and all of this is on my website. Uh, if you go to LorraineOnReady.com uh, and you <coughs> press the art menu and go into any one of the artworks there, you'll find that there is an image. Underneath that image is a link to the uh, slideshows. And, uh, and also there's a summary, there are two columns of text, one is a summary of the piece, and in the left-hand column there are links to articles about the piece, but written by me and by others. So. Yeah, it, it's a very, it's a very user-friendly website and very, um, it covers all the work that we just talked about and it's, it's I recommend the website. Um, so I have to ask the, like, what I feel like is the obvious question. Um, first, before we get into the questions about um, sort of where you're going, and that is, um, are we post-racial and post-feminist? Well, this is what, you know, is the big question, and I, uh, I understand how we use these phrases. We use these phrases to pretend as if we are so that we can just move forward. It's a, it's a way of just like getting out of the, being stuck. It's not that we're really describing a real situation, right. because uh, the very pe people who use the phrase post-racial the most are the ones who seem to do the most racial work. You know, I mean, they do their work about black people, but what they are doing is doing it from a stance where we are choosing to do this. We are not forced to do this. I think you're being very generous, because I think another way of putting it is that they're in denial. They may be. They may be. I don't know that I, I myself am extremely aware of the theoretical discourse around post-racialism and the kind of work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I see that my work is a way of saying we're not post-racial. But I'm not sure about other people and what their, mm -hmm. how they would just say it. I can't speak for anybody but myself. But, uh, so you think it's they're in denial? Well, I mean, I'm being slightly facetious. I, I don't find the terms particularly useful. It's not a useful <laughs> term, and I felt that it was just a, almost a marketing gimmick. And, um, but it serves the same sort of purpose that the term post-feminist serves. Post-colonial. And post-colonial, yeah. exactly. All of these post, post they, they, they are a way of saying, OK, get over it. Let's not talk about it anymore. I think the best post is post-post. <laughs> it's the only one that sort of allows you to have a yeah. conversation about what yeah. that means. Um, and this is kind of an aside, but I have to say, I keep thinking um, in relationship to the, the Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir figure who um, reflects, um, I think, my understanding of the white gloves and that whole sort of persona that you're, that you're capturing is um, sort of a privileged persona in some way. A privilege mm -hmm. uh, Yes, you know, I just gave a, a, a lecture to, uh, not a lecture, but I was interacting with an art history class at Wellesley just last week. And, you know, they, they, it was a class in African American art history, and half of the class were uh, black students. And they wanted to know how things were different when I was there, right? You know? And, you know, there's no way of talking about that period without involving privilege, do you know what I'm saying? And a privilege that you don't necessarily have to worry about. Right. Well, and what I, and this is, as I said, a slightly slide that I keep thinking about in relationship to this little thing that's going on now in the art world with um, Donna Wolford, which is this character that's been developed by oh, a, 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 a white ugly situation. And, uh, a, black woman artist who it, it comes from this privileged background. And I keep, I'll, I'm sorry, I just have to say, I feel like it's, um, when I'm looking at your piece, which is so directly addressing um, a, a lived experience that this other sort of project thing that's going on in the art world wide now and probably would fall under that conversation of post something um, feels very inadequate and very, um, well, I began as a performance artist, I have to say, uh, uh, because I uh, went to a performance by, um, uh, goodness, the, the performance artist who did uh, 
Ellen Anton, okay? I went to a performance uh, that she was giving, not knowing what it was going to be, and I, you know, it was uh, at 80 Langdon Street, I looked around, I was the only black person in the audience, uh, and uh, I watched Eleanor Anton give the performance, which was a slight performance uh, of her um, persona, uh, of uh, Eleanor Antonova, who was a black ballerina who had joined the Diaghilev Company in Paris in 1918. And um, Eleanor Anton is kind of like short and stubby, I mean, well, let's not go there, but I mean, she was not the ballerina type. And uh, my mother was 5'8", and reached thin, and very much the ballerina type. And so as she was giving this performance, I began to look at these images and listen to what she was saying about this woman's experience. And I said, this is so off. You know, because I can just imagine my mother having gone to Paris instead of going to Boston and having maybe, you know, joined that milieu, having uh, become maybe, a, you didn't have to be that great a dancer to dance with the IOF, you know, she could have done that. And what her life would have been had nothing to do with the presentation that Eleanor Anthony was making. And it was, that was the moment when I said, I have to speak for myself. I have to speak for myself. And so in some ways, my work is really, someone has said to me that my work is about making the invisible visible. And so I am talking, yes, about an upper middle, middle class, upper middle class black life that existed with great uh, 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 power and richness, uh, but, with, but deliberately effects, deliberately made invisible, so as not to be threatened. And so as a result, you could have somebody like uh, Michelle Obama and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, Barack Obama elected, and people thinking that they were somehow the first people who would ever live this way. <laughs> and you're continuing, you mentioned you're continuing engaging with, with, with her, with Mademoiselle Fiona yeah. Warren. And you mentioned wanting to think about what she would say now in some way, right? Yes. And it made me think, do you, have you, have you conceived of any of what her poem would be now? <laughs> no, I haven't gotten that far. That's in the, in the image making part. And she's not somebody that I really want to talk about that much because uh, she's sort of under wraps a little bit because she hasn't gotten far enough. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I don't know how you could critique the white and the black art worlds now in quite the confrontational way that I did then. I mean, I couldn't get away with it then, but I, I could do it then. I'm not even sure I can do it now. Uh, and, um, and then, but then there's this other thing about being post-feminist, post-racial, uh, in terms of my own personal life, and trying to explore what it meant to be these people. I could talk about Devonia and Nefertiti in one way, but I think I'll have to talk about Lina and Jean in quite another way, but I don't know what that way is yet. And I'm just kind of wondering, really, in some ways, what people in the audience think are the things that I need to look out for. What are the things I should worry about? I have one idea, and then we'll, which, just to throw out, one of the things that I think maybe another post that would have some, some usefulness in this context is post-binary. And, um, oh, I go that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so that is a very interesting way to start this conversation in relationship to that. So, yeah. Did you, I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm always invisible, so I always assume across the on you. I, I don't need to pour this room to this, but Lorraine is my former surrealism professor. That's how we first met. And uniquely struck. Can everybody hear? I just want to mention him in the mic. She was my professor at SVA. And uniquely in the world, only she and I ever in the history of America have a thing in common that no other black woman has done. And that could not be done prior to the Harlem Renaissance existing. And therefore making a space for black women of a miscegenated album like us to exist. So my question is, Lorraine, you know what I'm referring to. Post-racial in this post-binary that she just mentioned. I have to say that uh, uh, Candia uh, is the only person who ever followed my lead and became a rock critic. Physically, <laughs> 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 yeah. And I'm the only one that can be 
Wikipedia is a long list of There's reasons. a long list of things we have in common that we don't need to get into. It. So my question is, or can you please speak to, from the post-racial and the post-binary angle, we live in a world that was rock rock, you were saying earlier, rock rock because of sudden rock. So what you and I have done, the work is how how is one situate himself as a black Afropolitan post something, post post sorting of person black woman. Yeah, I think that's what you're saying yeah. in scenes. Okay, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I think that we, need, we need to develop our own language, our own terminology. Okay, so yeah, what I to answer that is, is that maybe, that maybe I'm asking, is your next work after about your mom? Maybe is that the time to address what it's like to be ourselves amongst people? If, I live, long, try to, try if I live long enough, Candy, I'll do it. Really? If I don't, you'll have to do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm doing it in records right now. So for your work, yeah. your body of work, my question is will you maybe address this issue of existing as yourself and me, your child, amongst, amongst, amongst European tribalism that is illegible? Because that's what rock and roll is. And I've only just found this out now that I'm making records. Yeah. So, and I've never been able to answer this since I was your student. So yeah. that's what I want to know. Well, I don't have any answers yet, but I'm struggling toward them. It's just a thorny problem, and it's always very, it's been very hard for me all along uh, because one of the benefits of this privilege was that I was arriving at the situation sooner than other people were. And so uh, the whole business of being uh, post-racial, which uh, was I actually, or post-black, was the term, uh, actually my trajectory was the opposite. I was post-black before I was black. In other words, I lived a life where my blackness, I thought, I thought my blackness had been uh, essentially made irrelevant. I was so successful in so many ways, and nobody ever uh, uh, treated me as though I were black until I got to the art world, and then I realized I was black. And so I went from being post-black to being black. <laughs> okay, so how did you come to the art world at age 45? Where is that transition? Well, uh, actually, I had gone to um, the Iowa Writers' Workshop to you know, try to write a novel, but I decided that I wasn't a very good writer. And then um, I came to New York um, with a boyfriend who was in the rock music business, and I started uh, freelancing for a, a Village Voice in Rolling Stone. And, um, and I began to see very clearly the limits of living a freelance life. And so a friend of mine who I had met at Iowa, um, who uh, was uh, having a breakup with his girlfriend, he was teaching at SBA, and he said, Lorraine, please, you've got to take these courses because I can't deal with it. He, he needed to deal full time with his breakup, right? So I took over his courses at SBA. And when I got there, I said, wow, this is much, this place is really more happening than Latin school or Wellesley or any of the other places, the other, you know, off type places I've gone to school. And I said, I need to figure out what's going on here. And so I went and I found a book, a, my first sort of like art book, to see what's going on. And the book that I picked up was Lucy Lepard's Six Years of Dematerialization. <laughs> okay. And I said, I said, I saw Lucy, and I said, you know, I said, I said, you know, I'm probably the only person in the world that ever read that book from cover to cover. And she said, No, you weren't. I said, Well, I said, I did. <laughs> and I said, at the end of it, I said, you have these ideas all the time, but you just didn't know they were art. And so then I said, oh, you could actually do something here. And SVA was the place where uh, the, the conceptual art movement had sort of begun and was being carried on in a way. And I was teaching uh, this course in Foundation English on the second floor on 23rd Street. And I saw that this guy was teaching on the third floor at the same time I was teaching. And I said, I told my class, okay, you stay here. I'm leaving. And I go upstairs to see this guy. And I took one look at him and I said, if he can do it, I can do it. Because his name is Vito Acconci. <laughs> <laughs> and he He had gone to Iowa Writers Workshop. I had gone to Iowa Writers Workshop. He declared himself a visual artist. If he did it, I could do it. 
And that's what I did. And the rest is history. Huh? And the rest is history. <laughs> well, so one of the things you mentioned about the piece, and then I promise we can move on to an, another word, is that you call it a failure. And then you call the, the piece, um, Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir, a failure in some sense because it didn't, didn't have a response that, I'm assuming, tell me if I'm wrong, the response uh, that you were hoping for. But then the life of the piece as it's gone on has obviously has had some impact. And I'm wondering if you still consider it a failure over the life of, of living with the work now and seeing where it's happened. You know, I don't, I haven't really come to grips with the success of my work. Um, uh, I mean, I get a lot of energy out of being transgressive, and I get a lot of energy out of the negativity that's coming toward me, so it just makes me want to try harder, uh, get angry and make more work. Uh, so I'm not sure that it's all that great a thing for me to be accepted, uh, but um, I'm not sure how far the acceptance goes. I know uh, that if I were to resume the same kinds of arguments that I was making in those pieces, if I were to pull up the political parts of those pieces and you know work with those, I don't know that the reception would be all that different today. Um, I think that. I think that longevity defangs work, it defangs people. And so, you know, I'm very aware that when I was using sort of the last of my attra physical attractiveness in Mademoiselle Bourdon Noir, that, you know, now I'm a little old lady, and so I'm not like so threatening or so, you know, you know I'm, I, I'm more lovable. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I don't. I think. I think I distrust the acceptance of these works in some ways. I feel like it's it's neutralized the the original message. Well, you know, for instance, uh, uh, Miscegenated Family Album is here uh, at at the museum that I wanted it to be at. Um, there were, had been some discussion. Connie Bond sort of talked to me about bringing it to the MoMA. And my feeling about Miscegenated Family Album was that it was a family piece. And Brooklyn was the place where family was. We were from Boston, but for uh, but, but the, all, all of our friends and relatives had settled in Brooklyn. Uh, because this was the place of the diaspora all my life so that we would get on the train and go to visit people and come back laden with the bread from the West Indian bakeries and, and so forth, you know. So this is the barrel of my people, and so I want that, want that piece to be here. On the other hand, I am not sure whether or not the Brooklyn Museum or the Brooklyn Dogeons deal with the controversial aspects of putting my sister with Nefertiti and what that means. Because I have come to feel that uh, the, uh, the cup, everything that we know about ancient Egypt, the Egypt that we think of as Egypt, which is pyramids, which is hieroglyphs, which is a certain kind of royal family, uh, uh, all of these were structures from the southern part of Egypt, the African part of Egypt. And, um, and yet that part of Egypt, which was strong and powerful and very, um, you know, advanced. They were the ones, I think, that first started to uh, dam the, uh, the, the, the River Nile and all of that and built agriculture. But Egypt did not really become its full self until the southern part, the African part, conquered the northern Mediterranean, more Europeanized part to become a unified whole. And I felt that the hybridization of Egypt, which is represented in the marriage politics that produced a uh, Nefertiti, had also produced something unexpected in slavery in the Western Hemisphere, which was these two cultures coming together and informing each other and becoming linked inextricably, culturally, racially, in every other way you can. And I felt that this hybridization was the source of great power, and I, that was also part of what I was putting up in the installation, as well as the critique of Egyptology. Because as I think, I, may, I don't know if I remember to say it, but I made the piece in 1980, and um, 
It was not until 1987 that a scholar at Cornell published his uh, book, four volume about opus called A Black Athena, which was about the influence of ancient Egypt on ancient Greece and how so much of what was Greece and what we think of as European actually derived from ancient Egypt. And all of, so, so if I was making this work before, seven years before Black Athena, and a curator once came to my studio and said, you know, when you were making this work, you were the only person who could vouch for these images. And so I made it very much out of like, Lorraine is saying, this is it. You know, but now, of course, what also happened is that the, it had to come a vocabulary in order to understand what I was doing. So a large part of what's happened in terms of the acceptability of the work is not, not just that I softened or it softened, but also that a critical structure has been built up around it and enabled its reception in a different way. I think you sort of just answered this, this question, but I, I, I pulled this quote from your website, actually, I thought was interesting in, in relationship to the politics of the piece. Um, the website says, O'Grady soon decided that the quad quadriptych um, shown in isolation from its larger context was both too baldly political. One artist said that it was more political than David Hammonds's How You Like Me Now, also in the show, and too pretty. Yeah, actually, uh, the business of, uh, of beauty and politics, and I belong very much to, uh, uh, I'm not alone. Uh, Tony Morrison has made this case very effectively about wanting work to be, uh, wanting to make work that is uh, um, radically political and unregenerately beautiful. You know? It, it can, both can be done. I mean, I think that the idea that political art has to be ugly is, I don't know whose idea that is, but it's certainly not mine, and it's not most black people's, and I can't imagine myself making art that's not beautiful. And I look at black people, and I say, no matter how bad it gets, they go out there with style. <laughs> and this is one of the most basic things about black culture, is it beauty, no matter what else is going on. And um, so I reject the premise that political art has to be uh, ugly or have rough edges in order to be effective. And, but that's been a problem for me. It, oh, it's too pretty, or it's too pretty. And um, some people felt that putting uh, two people up on the screen on the wall at the same time was gave you nowhere to go. Hmm. I don't know if I agree with that. Huh? I don't know if I agree with that. Yeah, but th that was also you know, an objection. It didn't allow you to just sit back and dream. But what it also is, is um, it's extremely moving in a very personal way. And I um, what I was trying to do. And as a result, it makes me think of, which is a, another question that, that your talk brought up, it's, it comes back to me, that link, what I think is the link between um, conceptual art and feminism, which is the personal is political. And um, I think that, that the piece very much is, is a part of that and is a great example of that. And so could you tell us maybe also a little bit about where and when you came to feminism? You mentioned the Heresies Collective and the same way that you seem to have entered the art world sort of um, in your finding your own path. I'm wondering if, how you came to, to feminism in New York in the well, same you know, way. I've had a very curious career in feminism. Um, And, and the reason is that I've always positioned myself as the black feminist who's bringing the message to the mainstream feminism, okay? And that's not been an easy position to be in. Uh, I know that there are black feminists who did not want to have that discussion, who felt that the discussion would be fruitless, hopeless, whatever, and not worth their time. And, but I always felt that it was worth my time to uh, try to move the comprehension of these differences further. And um, I, I did not have, uh, when I was at the height of, uh, uh, of my involvement in, in uh, mainstream feminism, um, Black was in 1991, 92, as you probably know, and others except around that time, uh, the, the, once again, we're talking about the language that enables understanding. 
And there was a thing that happened in uh, 1991, which the thing that, the, the thing that started WAC, Women's Action Coalition, was uh, the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas hearings. And uh, feminists were so incensed by that, that it sort of jump-started the feminist movement a second time. And, um, yeah, and at the same time, uh, the WAC was part of the sort of white response to feminism, white feminist response to, fem to, to the Anita Hill hearings. But there was another response which was uh, possibly not so well known, and that was that uh, just as WAC was starting, there was an advertisement in the New York Times, paid for with $25,000, which is what it cost them, full page, and it was signed by every black woman intellectual, artist, whatever, whatever, that you could think of, which was taking, which, which was speaking to, for Anita Hill, from the black feminist perspective. Who remember that? Yeah. Who organized that? I, huh? Who organized that? I, I'm not sure who the, I think it may have been the women around the Combahee, Combahee Collective, or there were several uh, important uh, black feminist collectives. They may have organized it, but the people whose names were the most prominent and who therefore took the most uh, private place were Tony Morrison, foremost among them. Okay, so, and she did, so she was one of the premier signers of that uh, ad. I was signed, but who knew who I was? I was way down at the bottom. <laughs> and but. Uh, Simultaneously with that, Toni Morrison, who was also an editor at Knopf, uh, simultaneously with that, Toni Morrison published a book about uh, racing gender. 1992, I think it came out. And there were a number of essays. She edited it. And there were a number of essays in that book. And one of them was by a young woman lawyer who was teaching, I guess, in her first teaching position at Sanford or UC Berkeley or wherever. And her name was Kimberly Crenshaw. And Kimberly Crenshaw became sort of the, one of the founders of the critical race movement. And uh, she, uh, she, within just a few years, by 1995, within three years after that book was uh, published, she had developed the linguistic structure to describe this, which is intersectional feminism. And that term has gone through some hard times more recently, but I would say that it really enabled a certain kind of discussion to begin to take place to move these understandings forward. Um, should I read a couple of the questions that you were thinking you might have interested in having the audience respond to? Um, What do you think of political art, and do you think that there is room for it now? Um, do you think that we live in a culture of post-feminism, post-racialism, or post-black culture? What kinds of attitudes and strategies would you suggest that Lorraine, very, very generous of you to ask these questions, adopt to help people understand um, what she is trying to say now? And then the last one is, um, you said this already, I think, in a way. What kind of problems might people expect you would encounter in doing this kind of work? I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what that question no, means I, to I'm you. I'm doing this work because I don't know any other kind of work to do. I mean, it's the work that does me and that I have to live like my life out doing. And the question is, am I going to run into the same kind of problems that my I ran into? Am I going to still run into the same kinds of problems that I ran into when I did this in 1980, or is it going to be easier? Is it going to be harder? I am. Yes. Unless. Yes. Even and though. I, even though. Yes. Which is why I asked the question that I asked. It might look different, but it will be the same thing. The, the face of it might not apparently at first glance be what, it, what you think it is, but if you then think about it, it'll be the same thing. What's and that face going to look like? What's, what's its appearance going to be? It's hard to say. I mean, you know. I'm sorry, Tamara Halloway is an extremely uh, highly regarded black art historian. She teaches at the University of Delaware, and she has a organization called the Association for Critical Race Art History, which is a part of the College Art Association. So she knows where she's speaking. So. <laughs> <laughs> what's hard to 
the word? Kamar. What's the word? Well, I, I, I was, I mean, okay, so, um, and Kadia is my twin sister, and, okay. Um, <laughs> We've had conversations, and you know, just like you were saying, things like post black. My sister and I were having conversations like this before I ever knew some of the was, right? Um, and in fact, one day we were in Boston Common and having this conversation of all places. But um, because of our generation, which is, we are, we're the first generation of blacks born after desegregation. And we've been thinking about our mother, who is pre-desegregation. And we have, we have a background of privilege at a certain extent, of going to schools like Mosley, et cetera. But things that my mother might have faced, or that you might have faced before 1970, we experience same things, but they look different. And they come from the people that you're hanging out with. And it might be a weird offhand comment, or it might be something that has some material consequence. It's not as necessarily overt, but the same impetus is behind it and the same intent. It's the same way in which now that Obama is president, people want to say racism no longer exists, but then all of a sudden, you know, Oprah cannot walk into a store on the left bank and buy a purse because she's perceived as being a, who can't afford an Amazon's bag or whatever it was that she, so it's going to look different, but it's going to be the same thing. It's really strange because one of the uh, phrases that I would get sometimes when I was a college student or you know a young adult, uh, just being myself, uh, I would run into this phrase uh, when I would be around certain kinds of white people, and there was the phrase, "Who does she think she is?" Okay, and. The frequency with which that phrase is addressed to Obama and Michelle is just frightening. Who does he think he is? Well, he's the president of the United States, but who does he think he is? <laughs> who does she think she is? And if that's what I'm saying, backstage at the Black Rose this year, if I go, I'm the uppity Negroes. And because they're Southern and from Georgia, I'm always the uppity Negroes. And that has not changed since 1991, 92, when I was in your class and didn't know that you'd ever written prostitutes because we're invisible. Which yes. would mean there's the legible, what our experience is. That's what I'm trying to say. So unfortunately, that's why we never subscribe to the post-life or the whatever the terms of the moment that are trying to Yeah. And that's why we have no friends either. <laughs> <laughs> walked into a certain space and you were treated as black. Black people are still going to be at some moment in their lives in this, you know, post-Obama, post-racial utopia, still treated as black. You just don't know how it's going to look that you're treated like black, but that moment is going to happen. Until that stops, your responses to your work in this new iteration, if it's Mademoiselle or if she's become Italian countess. I don't know who she's going to be now, but whoever she's going to be, there's going to be a moment where it's, there's going to be a backlash against it that is profoundly racial and gendered and sexualized, you know, and it's not going to accent it as the flaw that he wrote. So no, Kamara, Kamara I, I absolutely agree with you, and it's so frightening. It's frustrating, and it's frightening. Because I did live the 30 years that it took for that to sort of change for that first generation of work. I won't be here for that, for when it finally changes. Do you know what I'm saying? All I'm ever going to experience with this new work is. Yeah. And I have more freedoms than the women who were freedom writers and who did this and that. I have a lot more freedoms than my mother's generation did. But there are moments where still those same things happen. Uh, I want to know, there are several people here who are not black, and I'm wondering, does this just sound like a strange conversation that you're overhearing, or does it sound like a conversation that you are, that it's affecting you in any way? Well, 
Well, I think the whole notion of post-black or post-feminist is merely nonsense. I mean, they, they, life does not change that way. It will take, it will take generations for change to occur, and there have none of us, not even the youngest one here, uh, will live to see those phrases have a reality. I'm thinking about all the turmoil in the world today, where there are revolutions and uprisings going on everywhere. And so I'm thinking of our, I'm trying to think of our conversation in the context, the wider context of what's going on in the world today, which is in frightening and in a way encouraging because people are speaking up all over the place. But it's a very dangerous, tenuous moment that we're living in. What about others? Um, others of you who are not black, what does this mean <laughs> to you? I'm really more interested. I already know what to come on <laughs> You know, you like to think of well, the rest of the world is like this, but even in New York City there is still racism. But I have relatives who live in the South, Louisiana, Alabama. And when I go down there, if I'm in a beauty parlor and there's only white people in the beauty parlor, you will hear them say nigger and use that word like it's nothing. Because in the bigger world, we're all whites here, we all feel the same way. So it's shocking when I leave New York City that this is still happening. I feel like I've gone back 50, 60 years of time. Not that, you know, again, it's because there are races here in New York City too, but certainly not as blatant. So it's, 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 it's very, yeah. Yeah, and I, I also think, I think that holds true for not only the black identity, not only the female identity, but for a lot of different identities, both in class and different races. So I definitely think that that, like, although maybe not the same term would be used in a conversation I might have about my own identity, I think a lot of things ring true. And I think something that you touched on that's really interesting is the notion that a lot of the races Um, do we have time for one more question, or? I would, I would like to suggest that we 
suggest we continue this conversation in the reception because I feel like so many great points have been raised. Um, if we all just want to keep talking after this, I think that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.